podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show with myself, Jackie Jones, and Bob Cook. And Hi. Well, what we're going to be looking at, I'm really interested in this, is the rising, um, well, no, we're going to look at the rising online therapy next time, but what we're going to look yeah. at this time is how to work with people with intrusive thoughts. What are intrusive thoughts, Bob? Well, they're very normal. I mean, I don't know how you see intrusive thoughts, but I think most people have intrusive thoughts. I mean, if you think about from the moment we walk, we wake up till the moment we go to sleep, we're always talking to ourselves. So are uh, we talking internal dialogue? Is that intrusive thoughts? When people talk about intrusive thoughts, what they're talking about is thoughts that may appear um, uh, when they're, when they're any time during the day. So they may appear um, and that it might be, you know, my, things like fantasies or they might have harmful thoughts against themselves or they may think things that they haven't thought before or they may uh, obsess about things or they may think oh well I haven't you know shut the fridge in my house I better go back those those these sort of thoughts which I believe are in the subconsciousness but may raise their head and people don't know why okay so yeah, they they're quite normal. I have those an awful lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's any. I think, uh, and I think the most important thing to think about is that their thoughts. Now the problem is, of course, if people then may, uh, if they go the next step and action them, then we have got a problem. Yeah. But for lots of people who may think what pops in their head might be, oh, you know, I, you know, I. Well, hopefully not, but you know, uh, as I said, I didn't shut the fridge, or I didn't shut the gate, or I didn't shut the house, or maybe they have a sexual fantasy, or maybe they even think about harming themselves. But, but you know, there's a difference between thoughts and actions. Yeah, hundred percent agree with that, Bob. I talk with my clients so often about thoughts, and the thoughts create our feelings, and then we have a choice whether we act on them. And we, you know, hopefully we don't act on a lot of these compulsive, intrusive thoughts that might suddenly pop up and we don't know why we think them. And I think then people get worried about why they think about them. Yeah. But actually, if you're not, if you don't action them, they, my, my, my advice would be just to accept them and let them go. Yeah. But for somebody that does have an awful lot of overthinking, it's it's quite easy to say, just let them go. For me, one of the things I talk a lot with people about is that thoughts are neutral until we give them energy. A thought is just a thought, whether it's a good thought, a bad thought, an indifferent thought, I want chocolate ice cream thought, anything. It's the same makeup. And, but some we give more energy to and kind of build a story around it. And then, like you said, exactly, why am I having that thought? What's it about? Where's it coming from? What if I act on it? What if this happens? And then it becomes a bigger thing than what it needs to. Well, I agree with you. And, you know, uh, often intrusive thoughts might be linked to OCD. Yeah. And people might start worrying about them. Uh, things that pop up in their head are about, oh, I've left the keys in the car, or I keep thinking about um, whether X is safe or not, or I keep thinking about Joan, and I don't know why I do. So th these sort of thoughts might suddenly pop into people's heads, um, and they are internal, they're not external, I mean, they, unless you carry them, carry them out and put them into actions, it's not really a problem. The problem is when people start worrying and worrying and overthinking, and the real problem then is if they act out some of those thoughts. 
So how, how would you work with somebody in a therapeutic way if they came to you with overthinking, intrusive thoughts, worrying? Some of the overthinking can be protective. Some of the intrusive thoughts can be protective. In Most keeping, of them are survival, keeping, a lot of it. Yeah, and keeping yourself safe and thinking about whether I've, as I've said, whether I've left the phone or not, or whether I've left the keys in the car, or whether. So some of them are protective intrusive thoughts, aren't they? So that's not a problem. Yeah. The problem only becomes when the person's obsessing, overthinking, gets anxiety with the thoughts, or even may worry about acting uh, acting them out or if they move to actions then it becomes it may become a problem um but the first step is to normalize the process okay and then if a person if it gets to a place where they are so worried they might act them out and their functioning gets impaired or they find it hard to concentrate or they confuse themselves or they feel they're going to act out on these thoughts or some thoughts might appear in a way which isn't good for them, uh, then that's another story. So the first step is to normalise the process. And then if, if we are going to go to a step further where their functioning is a, impaired in some way, or there's a tremendous lot of anxiety, which means that they aren't able to stay an adult, or they think they're going to act out on those actual um, thoughts in ways which might not be useful then we might take it further and ask them to explore their thoughts and see how much you know how much it's how much it's actually in reality that they may sort of play out these thoughts or these actions and to get to the bottom of what these um, intrusive thoughts actually are yeah so that would be the next step. Yeah. And again, in a safe environment in the therapy room. Mm. Yeah. Well, go on. No, you carry on. No, I was going to say, because sometimes clients are okay kind of having the thoughts, but as soon as they start to talk about them, certain clients kind of think well now it's a thing because I've actually said it out loud it's not just something in my head it's not just internal talking about it is is kind of bringing it to life which can cause stress in itself for some clients well it may usually I have the opposite experience by the way I'm not you know in psychotherapy you know it, it's different for everybody but my experience is usually the opposite with people and that is once they are start actually um, talking about the thoughts or uh, what's going on for themselves internally, they usually feel much more rely relieved. And instead of repression, you get more relief. Now, that, that doesn't mean to say there are people who might bring it, bring it alive. Um, and... I, I'm still not quite sure what you mean by bring it alive. Do you mean that it becomes an entity and they feel compulsive that they're going to act on those processes? Or do you mean that it becomes alive for them so they'll get more scared? I mean... Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, to, I, I'm OK to talk personally. I talk quite a lot about my stuff. But I suffered from postnatal depression with all three of my children and it got progressively worse. And I can remember having an awful lot of intrusive thoughts um, after the birth of each one of my children. And I got scared when I spoke about it because suddenly then, it, you know, having it in my head was one thing. But when I spoke about it, then I got more anxious about, I suppose, people knowing about it. Am I likely to act on it? All those sorts of things. It then became a, a more real to me, if that makes sense. Well, okay, and it's the therapist's job then to listen to the story and normalise the process. Yeah, that's the that's the therapist's job there. Yeah, 
I, I, I was thinking a step further, really, uh, where I see intrusive thoughts can start to be problematic, particularly with it, and that's in post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. So in post-traumatic stress disorder, where somebody's had a traumatic experience in the past, that often does come out in flashbacks. It may come out in the present in, in, in intrusive thoughts. Yeah. So when I think of intrusive thoughts, I think of that process being linked particularly with post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe with OCD, um, but certainly those intrusive thoughts can often be a way of replaying the trauma in, an, in a way, in an attempt to get a different outcome. Yeah. Or even an attempt to relieve that trauma from their system. So it's very, very common for people with post-traumatic stress disorder to have intense intrusive thoughts that is linked not to the here and now, but to the time of the trauma. Yes, yeah. That's extraordinarily common. And actually, someone's got post-traumatic stress disorder, it'd be unusual for them not to have intrusive thoughts. Yeah. And I suppose the thoughts then, you know, the intrusive thoughts can be triggers to take them back somewhere. It usually is. Yeah. Absolutely. It's the same as the function of flashback, flashbacks. Yeah. Which is they're both triggers, like you've just said. However, the desire of both of them is to have to um or two parts of it. One, the desire to have a different outcome, and secondly, to get the thoughts and the flashbacks out of their system. The problem is, of course. Uh, especially with intrusive thoughts, people keep them in inside rather than outside. So I would always encourage people to talk about their intrusive thoughts. Now, of course, but with PTSD, if they talk about their intrusive thoughts, they usually go back to when the trauma actually began or when the trauma actually, you know, occurred. Yeah. That's where healing can happen. So for therapists dealing with PTSD and intuitive thoughts. As the person starts talking about the intuitive mind, the trauma. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, just recap over that again, because my screen actually froze, so I'm not sure whether we, we got that on the recording. Okay, didn't freeze my end, but I'll say it again. Yeah. When I think of intrusive thoughts, you're correct. I do think about in terms of, you know, people who come in, they overthink, they worry, they're frightened, they may act out their thoughts. I had somebody today in an assessment who actually had intrusive thoughts. They overthought. They were worried that they might act out those thoughts. And then they came to see me. Yeah. So, yes, just, I do see people like that. And the other thing I would say is, Intrusive thoughts are linked to post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. And they're often triggers that go back to the original trauma. So a therapist needs to trace the intrusive thoughts back to the traumatic occasion to help get, to get some healing for the client. Yeah. So I would always encourage and facilitate uh, people who have traumatic events who perhaps have intrusive thoughts today to externalize them so we can get back to where the real trauma is yeah it's the same with all intrusive thoughts actually but it, it's an interesting thing that you just talked about uh, uh, from a personal experience is that it became live more live for you perhaps we can talk about that in a minute but with most intrusive thoughts you would or not only help them get the intrusive thoughts out, and the next step would be normalization because it's very common. Yeah. Um, you would also trace back to where those thoughts actually occurred from. 
you know, what's the process behind them? What's the function of these thoughts? Now, yeah. sometimes they're protective and that's fine. So that's not a problem, but they, but they may, and usually do link back to some, some time of distress or trauma or where, or in fact, where they've been frightened or frightened themselves. That, that, yeah, see, I think that's very relevant where they were frightened or frightened themselves, because I think a lot of, you know, the, the clients that I see, it's around anxiety and it's like they kind of pin their anxiety on something. That's what caused it. And then the intrusive thoughts start around that, that what if, what if I do that again? What if that happens again? What if I catch a train and the same thing happens? And it's all that overthinking and the what ifs, which is a protective mechanism. Ah, that's what I was just wondering. You pointed out what I was going to point out. Yeah. You see the protection in that. Yes. Yeah. Now, usually with clients, when they start seeing, seeing these thoughts as protective, then the normalization is much easier to um process because they see the function of them yeah and then we can get down to what they're frightened of in the first place yeah i'm frightened of being like my mother i'm frightened of being like my father who hurt people i'm frightened of um so they get uh, x so they get intrusive thoughts about being violent yeah. just like their father did for example yeah or they get intrusive thoughts about um thinking about uh or sexualized you know young people or they get intrusive. but if you start if you start helping the person externalize these processes and trace them back to the point of origin or what the scare was that is part of the healing the worst process Jack, jackie is when the person keeps them internalized because if that happens it's very hard to get any help yeah and again you know just using a few of those examples that you've just spoke about i would imagine you know with certain thoughts there's there's a lot of shame and guilt around having certain thoughts which is why a lot of people i would imagine don't talk openly about the intrusive thoughts that they're having because of you know the, the the belief that what what is the other person gonna think about me if I tell them about these thoughts? Absolutely. So that's what I'm saying. Normalization. Yeah. Is the second stage after externalization. Yeah. With intrusive thoughts, and I I think most people have intrusive thoughts, and usually they're protective ones, and the person can accept them and move on. The problem comes, I said, when it's linked to trauma. When it's linked to OCD, and it's linked to anxiety. Yeah. And then they, then the person might go to a place where they find everyday functioning difficult. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that's what I see probably most in the therapy room. Which what? Um, around anxiety and um, things like that, overthinking, intrusive thoughts around, you know, and it, it is impacting on their life. As, as soon as they're doing something that they think is going to trigger their anxiety, you know, the, the world is getting smaller because of the, the intrusive thinking that they've got. That's right. So if we look at a stage plan for intrusive thinking, then encouraging them to externalize those thoughts number two normalization number three encourage them to see the function of the intrusive thoughts yeah uh, number five i think would be to trace back the origin or the repetitive processes involved in those intrusive thoughts uh, and usually, you know, however bizarre the intrusive thought is, if you trace the thought back to their origin, it's the opposite of bizarre, it's perfectly normal. Yeah. And that's when healing occurs. Yeah. 
And I think yeah. that's something I hear a lot of is, you know, before they even talk about the thoughts that they're having, they'll say it's really stupid, but it's ridiculous, but, and they're kind of, they're, they're minimising the thoughts that they're having. They're already talking about how ridiculous it is or it's stupid or it doesn't make any sense or... Yes, and, and also they're protecting themselves against perceived rejection or ridicule. Yeah. So that's why they say that. Yeah, which is why I said, you know, earlier on about the guilt around having certain thoughts and what the other person will think of them if they talk about it. Yeah. So this is all very normal, Jack, yeah. isn't it? And you are right when you say that... Uh, you know, that anxiety, overthinking, and especially the fear of acting out on their overthinking or their intuitive thoughts may bring uh, a certain lack of functioning. And that's when you need to start to help them externalize and talk about their intrusive thoughts. And certainly help them seeing that this is normal and protective. Yeah. And also, I'll repeat it again, when somebody's had high trauma and they haven't had therapy or they haven't dealt with it and they've compartmentalised, then they often have intrusive thoughts. And the intrusive thoughts are, number one, they're protective. And secondly, I think they're aimed at a desire for a different outcome. Yeah. So with trauma will come flashbacks, trigger, and will will often have intrusive thoughts. Yeah. And many intrusive thoughts, by the way, are as I said before, when people are frightened or have been frightened or have fear that they may act out like their perhaps abusive, dysfunctional family. Once they've started to separate out that they aren't that then healing can happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, I think it, you know, providing a safe space for them to talk about anything is, is really important. And it's one of the first things in therapy. Well, I've never had anybody come because of intrusive thoughts. It's always been part of something else that's brought them to therapy mm. yes yeah, it's, it, it's to do with trauma anxiety ocd particularly i think yeah you know often thinking about well i did i as i said earlier did i leave my the cars the key in the car or did i close the door or did i shut the fridge did i feed the cat did i take the dog for a walk did i do this did i do that and the more obsessive the process the more the overthinking and the more those thoughts rise up from um, their pre-consciousness and then they start worrying and overthinking. So they're all linked together. How long have you been seeing clients now, Bob? Well, I stopped two years ago, but I mean, still do therapy intensive, but one-to-one -one groups finished about two years ago. But when did you start? How long were, were you? Oh, 1985. Wow. So, so what, 30 years ish? 36 years, 37 but years. Would you say that you, towards the end of your, you know, practicing, that you were seeing more people with intrusive thinking than what you saw back in kind of 85? I think the language is different. I don't think people use the words intrusive thoughts back then okay. so all the common day phenomena as languages as mental health um, has been uh, more accessible and discussed um, diagnosis has changed language changed uh, but no, I would if I look back in 1985 1986 19 you know those 80s and early 90s I think people talked a lot about um, intrusive thoughts they probably just didn't use that language. Okay. It's only in recent times I've heard that language where people talk about they have intrusive thoughts because I think it's part of the mental health lexicon now. But yeah, back. I'm just thinking 
our lives now are a whole lot busier than what they used to be. You know what I mean? Social media, um, all those sorts of things, access to Google, you know, none of that was around kind of in 1985 and 1986 and things like that, that we, we've got access to so much more information now that I think sometimes our brains can find it difficult to process that information. Yeah. And whether you've seen a difference in that impacting on clients over a 36 year time frame. Oh, without a doubt. Absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Like when you were saying about, you know, checking that you'd left your keys in the door or that you'd turn the cooker off and things like that. I, I see that an awful lot, but it's because we're not mindful on what we're doing. Our head is so full of other stuff that we're not kind of in the here and now a lot of the time. So yeah, we forget whether we've done certain things because we're not focused on it. Yes, uh, true. And that's why I say intrusive thoughts are often linked to OCD. Yeah. And certainly linked to trauma. But if we use transaction analysis as a model to look at intrusive thoughts just for a moment, particularly the perhaps the more intensive or intense toxic uh, narrative thoughts, then we can think of using the PAC model a moment, parent, adult, child, uh, we need to start working out where those come from. Do yeah. they come from the internalized parent? So they actually aren't, you know, they aren't the words from themselves, for example. Yeah. Uh, do they come from the scared child, which is what I think mostly right. yeah. intrusive um, thoughts come from the child ego state, um, where the person's been frightened or, or fear. Um, and one thing that is really important about this is to help the client, how can I explain this, be able to soothe themselves under stress. In other words, you know, if somebody's got very little nurturing parent internally, they aren't so able to uh, soothe themselves or understand the process that when they get these sorts of thoughts, they're very common, it's okay, we can accept them and let them go. But, but often, what they start doing is telling themselves off. So there's a toxic narrative, just like you just said earlier on. Yeah. So I think TA is a good way of thinking about what we need to help the person internalize, which is a nurturing parent, which they probably never had, and help them understand quite often that these intrusive thoughts come from a child or younger self position in response to an internalized parent. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, Bob, yeah. That's something that I do talk a lot about with with clients, yeah. And being compassionate with that side of ourselves, that scared young child that, yeah. Because often we wouldn't do that to an actual child. If a child was scared or needed comforting, we wouldn't... Tell ourselves not tell them off. No, we would do the complete opposite, yeah. yeah. That's right. So that comes with the territory how to help people nurture themselves and accept uh, these thoughts as, uh, 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 as part of a whole process and move on from that and see them as normal. And also at the same time, if those thoughts are so frightening that the person isn't able to function well or regresses or frightens themselves so they get confused or, 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 or that process to, tr to trace back where those thoughts came from and what's the function of those thoughts and what's the scare about. And I say quite often it's linked to trauma. Yeah. The process is linked to trauma. And also if they've been in a, in a, in a traumatic family situation where they've been part of a dysfunctional system and so haven't been able to internalize a model of positivity, they often get scared that they're gonna act out like their mother and father or, um, people they've seen around them which hasn't been positively helpful yeah yeah which you know what what you were saying then it all kind of links together if they've been part of a you know a, a chaotic family and maybe they you know there was a time when they were younger where they didn't feel protected or safe 
you know, and nobody soothed them, then they don't know as an adult how to soothe themselves at times of high stress and emotion. And, you know, then it becomes part of who they are. So, yeah, it's mm. it's all linked together. Mm. Mm. I think self-soothing is something that a lot of us find difficult. We look for something external to make us feel better. <laughs> yeah, and if you haven't had um in your own history if you haven't had a model of somebody who is soothing to you or to um their partner or then you you, you haven't got that internalized model mm. um if you have a high if you are i don't know if we've talked about strokes in the podcast but if you're brought up on a culture of negative strokes then you haven't had a full meal yeah. and therefore you aren't able under stress to be able to soothe yourself and especially when you're having these intrusive thoughts mm. yeah 100 mm. percent. yeah and and for, i think we have touched on it in the very very early days um yeah positive strokes and and negative strokes and yeah mm. Mm. as a, a unit of recognition from our main caregivers yeah mm. Mm. so if we haven't had that or haven't internalized that experience it's much harder to be able to take care of ourselves in a kind way yeah and the lack of that leads to low self-esteem Yeah. So, you know, when when those clients come to us and say it's stupid and it's daft and, you know, all those sorts of things, it, it's it is quite normal for us to have intrusive thoughts. But if they're not dealt with compassionately or maybe in the right way, then the impact of that is like a domino effect with confidence, with self-esteem, with relationships, with trust, with all sorts of stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there. Interesting, interesting. So we'll leave it there. No doubts we'll come back to this. It was I, I quite like this subject. And mm -hmm. yeah, I and interested again to know more about the changes that you've seen over your career. But maybe okay. we'll hold that for the next podcast. Yeah. The biggest change I think is in accessibility to mental health services the destigmatization de of therapy and counselling and the change in language. Yeah. That's a long time that you've been doing it, Bob. A long time. A long, long time. Right, we'll, we'll leave that there. So the next episode, talking about how things have changed in the time that you've been doing it, we're looking at the, the impact or the growth of um, online oh, therapy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely, Interesting. Okie doke. Until the next one, Bob. Speak soon. Okay, great. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode. <laughs>